Hey, I wanted to make a video today about thankfulness and, you know, it's around Thanksgiving and, you know, one of the great things about God's provision for us in his word, is it tells us a lot about um, living, but we overlook it a lot and, and um, but you come back to it and you see it more. Now, giving thanks is a beautiful thing because the Bible says give thanks always. Now, that's great because you know what? Sometimes we get depressed and uh, we don't know how to get out of it. And one of the ways you can get out of it is just to give thanks for, like, say, 10 seconds to everything you see. All right. And you'll notice a change. Um, so try that. Okay. Um, and, and certainly God, um, gives us so much, um, and it, we're coming up on a Thanksgiving holiday and, you know, it's a commemoration, if you will, of, of, uh, the harvest and reaping and having enough food to hopefully make it through the winter, I think. And then whereas, um, May Day <laughs> used to be, um, a time where, People would be happy that they just made it through the winter. I mean, you look at the pilgrims, you know, like they would lose 50% of the people over the winter and when their first couple of years, you know. But so giving thanks is a, a blessing because you are um, recognizing God and recognize what's important. And it's a way to cope with um your problems your life and uh it puts things in perspective right that you hear that a lot is you gotta keep things in perspective you uh, suffer from depression that's one of the most um you know, insightful things to know because it is about perception your your perception perceptions all been twisted and 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 warped and um you know you know your your expectations for life have been influenced by possibly demonic um influences and, and we can see that we have no hope now i want to share something special for you today because um one of the things I've learned also is, you know, you, you take 10 seconds and you, like I said, give thanks to everything you see for 10 seconds and you'll feel uh, like a metamorphosis, you know, giving thanks to God and um, to Jesus. Now, well, uh, like a something, what's the word, um, a way you can also um, find ways like a cheat code in dealing with life. All right. And getting more out of life, having a more fulfilling life, um, and taking back a little bit control of your life is just for seven minutes a day. Now we went from <laughs> 10 seconds, which is a short little shot in the arm, but it can absolutely transform your life. But you've just take t seven minutes a day to read okay um and set up an area in your plate in your house where it's a specific place that you can read for seven minutes a day um find that place you know and um you'll be happy you did now the beautiful thing about it is is we all want to be reading more than seven minutes a day um and um but if you set that goal of seven minutes a day you can hit that goal. That's a hittable goal. Now, if you go out and say, I want to read, I want to start reading more. I'm going to read an hour today, every day, you know, um, make it your New Year's res resolution or whatever. But trust me, that's very difficult, especially for somebody who's not accustomed to reading and all our time spoken for. Plus, we get, um, we're all TV babies if you're growing up in the 60s and the 70s, um, you're basically a TV baby. So you're probably not accustomed 
to to having a lifestyle of reading but but if you just take the seven minute approach and plus trust me i have a lot of books most of my books i've never even read i've skimmed them you know um but but i'm telling you you can find ways to do it and you can tie this back into depression because if you set a goal of an hour you're not going to hit it and you're going to be depressed so to avoid that you set a goal of seven minutes and what happens once you sit down for seven minutes you end up reading an hour at least i do um in two hours often every day um and I think, you know, obviously I believe reading the Bible is, is very important. And, um, and there's so much in the Bible, so much history, obviously, and, and um, you know, countries and peoples and languages and, and, and you know, events. Uh, and they've, they've all been corroborated um, independently of the Bible, you know. And the Bible has a, 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 an exciting element of prophecy, that's the most exciting element for even new believers. The Apostle Paul actually talked to the new believers in Thessalonica about prophecy and encouraged them, you know, to, to, so it's, it's great. You know, we, we go to church and we, we hear about the Bible, but we think, um, I guess, I guess I got to charge this. Um, we, we think we, we, you know, we have to read all these stories that we've heard since kindergarten or whatever. But trust me, the prophetic element, 25% of the Bible is prophetic. And God tells us to that I'm the one who tells you what's to come. Right? Now, I've talked about prophecy in many of my other videos. Uh, but that for a new believer, I recommend prophecy to get you excited about God because he's the one who tells us what's to come. Now, Hal Lindsey just passed away yesterday and he was, you know, one of the greatest writers in Christian in 20th century uh, about regarding, pro he was the top prophecy writer. Um, and I believe he was the top um, uh, writer for the decade of the 70s in the New York Times. Uh, books, reviews. Um, so he wrote in 1969, The Late Great Planet Earth. Now, I read that book when I was, you know, 35. And the book had been out, you know, 30 years. And <laughs> do the math. So I read it in 95. So, you know, do the math. Uh, 25, 26 years. And um, it had already been been out there, uh, and he wrote the late great planet Earth. Um, speaking of hell, I'm not sure if I have his book. I know I have all his books, but um, in many of his books, you know, he wrote the late great planet Earth in 1969. Satan is a, a, alive and well on planet Earth. Um, he just wrote dozens of dozens of books. Uh, his one, he wrote the Apocalypse Code. You know, you talk about the Bible and the prophecies. Ezekiel 38, 39 is something that a lot of people are talking about nowadays. Um, will it happen before the rapture or after rapture? You know, Hal Lindsey talked a lot about the rapture. We could talk about this for a long time, obviously. But I want to try to make this brief because I wanted to make one um, point here, actually. <laughs> that, you know, when you do read, you find surprises. But let's get back to Hal real quick. You got the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel. You know, you got it in Psalms. And, and um, I was just reading Psalms 16. Um and 109, I mean, this prophecy, you just look in Acts, they reference back to the psalm. Um, and that's what I want to talk about is something I found really cool. It's in the book of Psalm, Psalm 16. And you know what I have? I have two Bibles that I have going at the same time. Of course, I don't have them queued up, but um, 
I'm going to turn to one. It's in the book of Acts. And we're going to just read one, one amazing blessing for people um, to know about. And it's just in the second or third chapter. Um, I wish I had my glasses. I just had them. Uh, what I do with them. But um, so, so that's why we need Jesus, because we need him. We're all dying. <laughs> and all right, so it goes. But um, let me just try to find my glasses. Yeah, they fell. Okay. So let's just read this. Um, I'm going to go from Acts chapter 2. And this is Peter talking, okay, to the crowd. Now, what happened was they were all together. The 120 were together. And they had just picked um, Matthias to be, uh, the, the to replace Judas, you know, because, um, I, I, what was it, Psalm, one of the Psalms said that you have to, um, the, um, where is it? Mm. Yeah, Psalm 20, so I'm sorry, Psalm 109.8 um, says that may another take his place of leadership. So Peter said it is written in the book of Psalms. This is Peter talking. He's quoting the book of Psalms. And they're talking about replacing Judas. And he says, may another take his place of leadership. This is Peter. So you want to go back to Psalm 109, verse 8, and read that. And it's just this throwaway Psalm. I mean, you don't even, <laughs> you don't even see the, it's amazing that this psalm is, is picked up in, in, in Peter's um, sermon. Uh, so Peter um, was the leader here, basically, of, of the 12. And, you know, Paul obviously is not around. And um, Paul gets saved later on. So um, so this is after they had uh, seen Jesus uh, ascend, you know. And um, then they all returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And when um, they when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room, and that's where they were staying. And those presents were Peter, John, James, and Andrew. This is Acts chapter 1. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. So there's two Jameses, and one James is, has a son here, and they all join together constantly in prayer, along with the women in Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The antecedent is Jesus. So in those days, Peter would stand up among the believers, and it says a group of numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke along through the mouth of David concerning Judas. <laughs> this is a remarkable. Who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. The book of Acts is, let me just say this, the book of Acts is a great book to start as a, a beginner because, you know, one of the things I've done and, um, you know, you hear about all these names and you, you, later on in the book of Acts, you hear about Paul's conversion and his, his, he takes three um, trips to eight minor Asia and into Greece you know, and, and a lot of times he goes back. Uh, his first one, he just goes to uh, Cyprus and then up to Asia Minor and he gets stoned and dragged and was killed. And he goes back through the same area, basically. He ends up finding Timothy at one point, whether it's first or second ministry, I forget. But he comes back, you know, through Antioch and um, Lystra, Derby, um, and then the two towns near near the, um, the, the water. And, and then he goes back um, to, I think, Caesarea. Um, maybe I'll get that. I, I've done uh, I've done a great study on that. My point is that you hear all these names. So what do you need to find out where they are? You need a good Bible atlas 
So if you don't have a Bible atlas, you're really missing it when you read the book of Acts and many of the other um, uh, books of the Bible, you know. You, you, you know, you, you hear, you, even when you're reading about the Old Testament prophets and the kings, you read about the kings and the judges, you know, of course, Joshua and Moses ushered them through the desert land, and you have Joshua, the military leader, bringing them into um, and, and wiping out all the peoples, you know. So you have a bunch of peoples who are in um, this area, all right, um, in the promised land. And, you know, you got the Hittites, the Hivites, the, uh, the, the Jebusites, um, you know, there's just like seven people groups of Canaanites, um, the Gergavites. I got, I got five out of seven, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, so the, the, when Joshua brought them in, the 12 tribes of Israel, um, so you can look up these names, right? And you, in a map or, or you go online and do it and you just see where they all were allocated. Then you have the 12 tribes replacing them. Right, and up north, you know, I couldn't really remember them unless I had the map. So I know I have up up along the ocean, the plains of Sharon uh, is Asher, right? Then you get Naphtali, it's up there. These are the tribes of, of Israel. And Dan ends up up there too. But Dan was alongside the ocean, but they didn't do the job of, of um, wiping out the, the, uh, the land there, and, you know, with the the Philistines and the Canaanites. They had problems with them. So Dan was in two places. Now the son, Joseph had two sons. He had Manasseh and Ephraim, and they were given lands instead of Joseph. So Manasseh's on two huge sides, two sides of the Jordan River, um, river in, is, in Israel. This would be in his, like, because you get Judah down below and you get Israel up above. So this is, you know, I, you know, I, I have, I have a, um, Actually, I don't know if this even has the the names, but but this is a topography map, okay? So this shows you how the mountainous it all is. And Moses, when he went to look into the promised land, this is the angle he saw from Mount Nebo, you know? But look how mountainous it is. You never know that it was, it was that mountainous, you know? So the line here for... Uh, Israel's like up here when they did divide, it was all one at once, right? And then eventually they they divide, so the line would be here. And so up here, up top is like Asher would be up here. Naphtali's up here. Now, uh, uh, up here. And Manasseh is like right here. Oops. Right here. And then also right here, it's split. It's lit by the Jordan River. It almost doesn't even touch each other. And that's along where the, the Golan Heights are up here too, okay? And so, and that's just basically where the Golan Heights are. And then um, you have Zebulun, you know, in, in there too. That's another uh, a tribe of Israel. So in, in Naphtali. So Jesus, I think, was from the land of Zebulun, if I'm not mistaken. Which you really so when you see it, see these names, they make more sense. So and then and then you have, you know, the Levites were spread out everywhere. Okay, there was like forty eight cities that the Levites were spread out. Um. And then you you have Judah, right? And coming down, you have uh, Ephraim, close, getting closer to Jerusalem, and then I uh, have um, Benjamin. <laughs> I'm going to say Bethlehem. Benjamin you have alongside there, right next to um, Ephraim. We know the importance of Bethlehem. Um, and and uh, um, and then that, that's where Jesus was born, obviously. And, and he was from Galilee. All the disciples, uh, the apostles were from Galilee. And it talks about we needed to have another, you know, they're in Jerusalem now. We needed a new, somebody who was there who saw John's baptism of Jesus, you know, saw a lot of the miracles. Had to be so it came down to Matthias, and I just read this, so it's fresh and uh, not Bartholomew, but um, I and I got to name the, the twelve apostles too, but um, you know, be but <laughs> but anyway, um, so they did choose um, 
um, Matthias as as the um, next next disciple uh, to replace Judah. So, um, but down below you have Judah. It's a big name. Goes all the way down to Gaza. But there's a, a an enclave, you know, of Simeon right there. Okay, and then you got Gad and Reuben on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and that's really not even into the promised land, but they were given that land for, I, I think it says, you know, disciplinary reasons for Reuben anyway. I think he, he slept with somebody he shouldn't have, um, and it caused a lot of problems, but uh, you can look that one up. So what I'm trying to say is you, these things come more alive if you have, um, and, you, and you know, you, you should let your curiosity go, you know, and you say, oh, what is that? And you got to, you know, you need a Bible dictionary, too. Now, we, we all know Bible, but Bible handbooks are great. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, but dictionaries really are good, too, you know. So don't forget your Bible dictionary. <laughs> and so that's how you can, you can trace a lot. It's amazing what you can trace there. You, you know, I end up reading a lot about Alexander the Great recently, the Seleucid dynasty, you know, the, 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 um, um, what is it, the, 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 um, Herod and all the, you know, you know Antioch, Epiphanes, uh, trying to Hellenize the area and le leading to Hanukkah and the Maccabees, um, revolt in the, you know, so you, you, you kind of get it tied together, you know, and then you, you see how important Damascus is. And, you know, Paul went out there. Damascus was like the economic center for that whole area. It's a very important area. Paul ends up going in with letters to, you know, take down the church out there. And that's when Jesus met him. All right. So, uh, and, and that whole area is a land bridge to three continents. Okay. It's basically, it is the center of the earth, really. Um in the Bible talks about in in, in, G, in Jerusalem is the apple of God's eye. Okay, so um, in the land is His land, right? <laughs> That's what we forget. It's not just the Jews' land, the Arabs' land, the Christian land. It's His land. All right, so that's that's something we forget. Um, but I wanted to go back to one little thing. I'm trying to get over here. Because I have a treat for you, because um, in Psalm 16, if we go to Acts um, 2, you know, we, we read we read about Psalm 109 and Psalm, um, how, how Peter keeps quoting Acts, you know, and he also says, about Judas, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And he's quoting Psalms again, and he's right, comes right on, right up the top of all the books. You know, he, he's quoting um, Psalms. So that's located in a very good Psalm, Psalm 69. Now, I had a pastor who would only read the first half of Psalm 69, kind of like a woe is me type uh, Psalm, but you got to read the whole Psalm because. Uh, that's the Bible, you know. Um, so, what I wanted to do is, is is move over here to when Peter continues to talk about um, how um, he was like the leader back then, okay? And the, the day of Pentecost comes, and they were all together. Now, the antecedent is not just 12. It has to be more than 12, because why... Because they all end up speaking in tongues in different languages, so it's probably more. It was, the antecedents probably 120 people, okay, and they were all in one place. And it says suddenly, a sound like the blowing of the violent wind came from heaven in the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what they what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then continuing in verse 5, chapter 2, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews. 
all right and if i they, so these are god-fearing jews you know jerusalem's all jewish and uh when they heard this sound right they heard it and you know small town you can't keep these things a secret and a crowd came together in bewilderment i love the word of god because each one of them heard each one of because each one heard them speaking in his own language utterly amazed <laughs> i love the word they asked i not all these men who are speaking galileans see they knew something about these these guys they were all galileans now that harkens back to well maybe there was only 12 here because i think the 12 were just galileans but maybe the 120 were all from galilee i don't know but long and the short of it they they heard now this is where the the bible atlas comes in to help okay and actually there's a map here too but he heard them all speaking in um his own native tongue and how is it that each of us hears them in his own native tongue parthians mede and elamites it's a far, that's the east like uh, iraq iran you know mesopotamia and it, uh, it mentions mesopotamia and then judea um and cappadocia and i was um north um heading towards russia <laughs> moscow but like turkey um pontus is the same area in asia asia like turkey but i think that's what they meant figria and philippia now those are the two cities where paul went when he left cyprus he went to i can never remember their names for the life of me figria and pamphylia and then from there he went to um iaconium antioch lystra and derby gets you know beat up in lister i believe he, he stoned to death practically they drag him out you know he goes to the by the way he, he goes to the synagogues in like all these towns all these places you know is the jews were spread out you know and they had established synagogues and the greeks allowed them to uh ha have you know to, to worship their god and and uh and then the romans took over in um 63 bc i believe and when pompey pompey conquered a lot of the lands um anyway that's an interesting story too you can you know i'm not you know i'm, I'm connecting the dots there but i'm pretty sure that's how it worked um pompey came in you know and they they use proxies and to, to govern you know and you see that a lot um you know many you know there was felix you read about that later and in, in, in acts fascinating you know um stories felix and um in various in cyprus there was a governor and um and paul went before me i think he gets converted if you read that and read that story on paul's first missionary journey journey um so this is all great stuff so you can get a bible atlas and look up obviously all these towns or your my bible is a study bible it shows you where all these places were from so people heard then you know the language um and they, they were perplexed you know um uh so so that's the, that's where it comes to life that's where you can you know these just you know you just hear when you go to church you just hear these names and but having a, a personal bible study going for yourself you're getting into these things you know and, and you know my yeah i mean pastors they kind of encourage us to a certain degree but I, I really they really need to strongly emphasize that the individual christian needs to read the bible and have helps with them you know we have the you know concordance or, um is it is important i haven't mentioned that you know but um the bible atlas bible dictionary bible commentary um even the internet right i mean obviously that's a huge help too i mean that's a good at usage of the internet you just got to be careful with um you know sometimes there's a bias there and 
Um, and, and so, uh, and then you have different Bible translations too, uh, as well. But um, anyway, um, moving on, I, I just wanted to show you what I really wanted to talk about because I, I have a special blessing for you uh, if you if you're hanging in there with me. Um, and and so, um, continuing the other names, he uh, he, he says uh, after Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, that was closer to the ocean. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to uh, Judaism. Cretans, that's that island right off the coast there near Ty Ty Tyre and Caesarea. Caesarea, by the way, was a Roman stronghold, the, the military area. That's where uh, um, Cornelius ends up getting saved. And Peter bumps bumps into him. He, Peter uh, Cornelius asked Peter to come up there, and you know that was where Peter got that vision and to to share the word, you know, um, with, with with the Gentiles, you know. And then when he comes back to Jerusalem, because he had that dream, right, with the four four winds and to eat all, you know, eat you know eat everything or whatever it was and the gist of it was that it's okay to share the gospel with a centurion but you know and so he did and then he went back to jerusalem and the jews there the jewish christians were like why are you sharing jesus with non-jews i mean um that's in acts 10 and, and peter's like you know God showed, told me to do this, you know, and he's like, oh, okay, basically, then they have been granted, you know, faith and repentance to salvation, that's what the Jews, so from then on, and then right around that same time, I think, Paul, Apostle Paul gets saved, and he becomes the instrument to the, 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 the Gentiles, all right, so, so and, and uh, Peter, you know, and and John or, or or I mean Peter and and Paul were or key were two keys in in that were God obviously and Paul went on his three missionary journeys and the church was further established but the Jews were established were established in all these syn synagogues all over uh, the world Greece and and of course Paul got beat up every time when he makes it over to Greece and Ephesus um, you know and coming down from Thessalonica. Uh, and down to um you know the cities they had those multiple cities um philippi and um coming down uh, and of course um, um uh, <laughs> multiple cities there he makes it all the way down to athens and, and um and corinth and, and back to Athens, and, and that's where he meets uh, priscilla and achilia who became key because they were tent makers and Paul was a tent maker, so he could sustain himself some more. And then they help, and when he goes back to Ephesus, they they come along uh, with him, and they stay there for a while. And Apollos is there. Apollos goes back to Athens, right? and then pa Paul ends up coming back to Athens and Corinth and going back. So he's back and forth. And they're thinking on the fourth missionary journey. He actually, you know, obviously he goes to Rome at the end. He appeals to Rome when he's. Um, you know, they, they bring charges against him in, in Jerusalem. And he appeals to Rome because he's a Roman citizen, right? <laughs> and he ends up in Rome. Um, and then they're thinking his fourth missionary journey was uh, in, to Spain, but nobody really knows that uh, for sure. Um, but, um, so anyway, um, and, and um, there was one city up there, it begins with a B, right? <laughs> And these were the, the saints. This was up by Thessalonica, the 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 saints burger or something. I, don't know, I gotta look that up. Um, anyway, um, see that's why you have a dictionary, right? If it's there, you don't always. They don't. The dictionary doesn't always um, have what you're looking for. But this is a good example of looking something up, and it's not. I can't find it. But. 
Berea, of course, Berea. See, the dictionary. I don't know why I drew a blank on that, but um, Berea, so it was next to Thessalonica and um, Thessaloniki and, and um, Philippi. And he had a vision when he was in Troy, too, to go over there his first time, first time, I think. So the, the it's, it's amazing uh, what led Paul around. Uh, um, and of course, he, he goes to Athens and, you know, he talks about the unknown God there. And the Corinthians, they were Christians, but they were immature, you know, in, in baby Christians. But Paul still calls them Christians. You know, and that shows you salvation occurs at faith. And then there's um, sanctification, right? Um, and, and they were, not only were they babies, but they were, some of them are carnal. But guess what? They were still Christians. So, you know, that's why salvation is by faith. And that's why, you know, the church sometimes makes it hard for people to see that sal salvation is easy just by faith and they make it hard and once you start making it hard it's a turn off right salvation a child can it can get saved man right a child can understand it but i wanted to bring bring you guys over i want to close with um this this very uh incredible um verse because you know, Peter, as he's talking to the crowd, um, he, he's, he ends up addressing these Jews who, you know, they were all making fun of these people who were uh, getting, um, you, you know, speaking in tongues, if you will, with all these different languages. And, and he could, they couldn't believe it. That got their attention. So we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our tongues. And amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And some, however, made fun of them and said, so not everybody made fun of them, but they said they have had too much wine. There's always like that wise guy in the crowd, right? But Peter heard that and Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. So maybe it was 11. I mean, this since there was so many tongues being heard, I mean, there's 15 different nations or, or groups, um, languages mentioned. So that people are thinking, you know, scholars think that it had to be more than 12 um, apostles there, right? Um, but but no, no, maybe there was just 12 in the, you know, I mean, if, uh, maybe I, I could be speaking in tongues in, you know, Ar Arabian and then the next time in, uh, you know, as an Eliumite or an Armenianite, <laughs> I suppose, I, I guess, I don't know. Um, probably they didn't know. Obviously, I don't think the disciples are all from Galilee. They didn't know what they were speaking. So if it was just 12, it was, it was, it was something to think about. But a lot of people think there were more than 12. But um, I'm, I'm up in the air on that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussion. Not a lot. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of discussion. But... So that's something people can discuss. So he gets up and he addresses them and he says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> maybe they maybe they were drinkers, right? <laughs> but not right now. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So this is great. Joel, I think, is one of the oldest, um, newest books in the Bible. I could be wrong. But uh, in the last days, God I, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So this is what's happening here. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will, will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So even on my servants, I guess that would be um, 
believers. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the, how hard is that? That's all you have to do to be saved. Everyone who calls on that name of the Lord. So things are going to start happening. People are going to be calling out. Okay. But these are, so Paul, Paul, Peter's talking about these are the last days here, you know. And let me just charge this again because who knows what's going to happen. Forgive me, but I'm going to try to wrap this up. It's a wonderful life. All right. I wish I had my regular uh, doohickey here. Um, is this charging? Hey. I don't know if it is. Okay. I'll have to... Well, if this cuts off, I apologize. But I wanted to get to this last point. Where pa P Peter ends up continuing speaking to these Israelites... Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. This, that's a street cred, right? Which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And now this is what I wanted to share with you. But, but So David said about him, now we're going to quote another psalm. Here's Paul, Peter quoting another psalm. Why is psalm? You know, we just kind of overlook at these psalms, but here's Peter. This is like at least the third or fourth time well he quoted Joel this is the third time um he he quoted Psalms about that and um so what does he say I saw the Lord this is Psalm this is Psalm 16 right that's what I got right here okay I got two Bibles going here I saw the Lord always stand before me Always before me, I'm sorry. And this is David's talking about the Lord. I saw, see, see, the context is God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. All right, let's get the momentum going again. I saw the Lord always before me. This is David now talking. Peter's quoting David, talking to these Jews. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope. Wow. <laughs> this is stuff that we need to hear. This is good. This is your life. This is, you know, what we need. Okay. So your heart is glad. His, so our heart can be had. David's heart is glad. And his tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope. You can live in hope now. None of this depression, okay? Because Jesus will not abandon me to the grave, and nor will he let your holy ones see decay. We are called holy ones, right? Now, David's an example of that. He's a prime example. You have made known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. End quote. Now, that's what it says. Okay? That's where Peter finishes. You know, he, Jesus does this somewhere else. But there's more to this psalm. And if you took the time and did a little digging, and I, you know, I love being a miner for God, and all you got to do is just go back and read that psalm and see what the rest of it says. I don't know why Peter stopped there. But what does it say there? He's given us all this great stuff to look to uh to know about who what how to live our lives you know on a on a spiritual level we're not abandoned okay 
you know, you know, you're not going to let us decay. You know, our heart is glad as a result. Our tongue rejoices. My body lives in hope now. Okay, um, this is this is the most important stuff in life right here. And you have made known to me the path of life. Okay, all right. And you fill me with joy in your presence. He stops right there for some reason, Peter. And then brother, and he says, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was head, ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received the Father from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, this is another psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, <laughs> let all Israel be assured of this. God had made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said, and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit, the promises for your children and for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is Acts chapter 2. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. You know, if you spend more than 17 seconds listening to the radio, to the television, you have to guard your mind. Because your, your brain ends up taking on, your brain neurons feeds on each other. And so guard your mind, you know, and protect yourself from this corrupt generation. And you're not going to be able to remember a lot of things, okay? And so those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number that day. So they went from 120 to 3,000 uh, in 120. But, you know, repent and be baptized, Repent means to rethink who Jesus is. We all heard of Jesus. That's what we need to do is rethink who Jesus is. Call on his name and you will be saved. Because when you rethink, then you realize he's God. You call on his name we will be saved. Now, going back to that quote where Peter says, you have made, you know, he's quoting Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 16. And he leaves off and he doesn't finish the Psalm. There's one more verse there half a verse <laughs> it's like verse c he does verse uh, verse 11 he does verse a which is you have made known to me the path of life verse b 11b you will fill me with your joy in your presence but he doesn't read the last one what's the last one saying it's amazing what he says he forget he doesn't forget he just cuts it out but it's a it's what you get when it's a little treat from God, a little special bonus for you. Because what he says is, after he says, you have made known to me the path of life, you will fill me with your joy, with joy in your presence. Now that's amazing. You will fill me with joy. So when we get to heaven, he's going to fill us with joy. He's going to fill it. You know, it's not going to have to come from you. Plus, you know, God is our, our bodies are the temple of God now. Okay, the believers. So he's already inside us. And then he says, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So he's going to fill us with joy in your presence. But what's not mentioned in Acts chapter 2 is what's mentioned in Psalm 16, verse 11. Um, not A, not B, which is mentioned in the New, Te the, the New Testament. But C says, with, pleasure, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Wow, what a gift from God just doing a little digging and just reading the, going back to Psalms 16. And that's what I mean by, you know, you have 
a lot going on. You go back, you read the psalm, you get a bonus gift like that. And what's the bonus gift? Eternal pleasures at God's right hand that he's going to give to me and fill me with joy in his presence. Peter, for some reason, cuts off at that verse, uh, at, ver at B, you know, 11A, 11B. He doesn't say 11C, but if you go back to the Old Testament, read the psalm, it says, with the eternal pleasures at your right hand. <laughs> that blew me away today when I read that. I just discovered that today. I had to share it with you, and I hope you received that. And that was my little journey through uh, the book of Acts and Psalms today. And I hope you um, got something out of it. Um, and find your own journey, you know, don't, this is what I've discovered. This is how I've learned how to do things. The pastor should be encouraging people to get the devotion. And, you know, I've heard this from time to time over the years, especially as a new believer, people told me that, And but it's very true. You got to get your own little library going, little desk, you know, where you can sit down. You know, if you need reading glasses, you got to get a nice light over your, your Bibles. I would have two Bibles going at the same time. I read the NIV, the 1984 version. It helps me. I, I'm not into the King James, the New King James, um, the NACB. The, you know, this Bible speaks to me better. You know, I'm sure. I'm sure there's problems. There's problems with every um, translation. I do not read the 2011 NIV. That you know, it was a, is a woke version and. Um, before woke became woke, you know, but you know, the, actually, the first Bible I ever read was <laughs> was was um the Living Bible, and I got saved reading through that. So you you can get saved; the Word of God can save you, you know. Um, but yeah, check out um Acts chapter two. Um, where you know where does he say that? Just to summarize the verses, and he's quoting Peter talking to the jews there and he's and at the end he's on verse 25 he quotes again another psalm this is the third or fourth psalm he quoted 109 he quoted 69 um psalm 69 and um and now he's quoting um uh, from extensively not just a little quote the, the other two were just little quotes this is an extensive quotation but he, he stops <laughs> and then if you just happen to check it out you what a gift you get when you check it out eternal he fills us with joy how does he do it it doesn't really say it peter didn't really say and david says it here psalm 17 with eternal psalm 16 11 with eternal pleasures at your right hand that's how one of the ways so we have eternal pleasures at god's right hand that he's going to fill us with joy with all right. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is this is this is too much. I, I love this. I love this uh, little treat that God gave me today. Um, and you you can find things like this too. Um, the Word of God is life. It's living and active. It goes forth into the and it, it, it enlivens our hearts and our ears and our hearts and frees our will. You know, it does not return void, Isaiah 55. And it's God's word, you know, Jesus, you know, God, uh, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the God and, and the word became flesh. John, you know, one chapter one, verse, you know, one through 14. Um, so John six <laughs> says these words are life right so let's we all want life right we're all trying to find life you know we all want a riching life you can't do it without god's word you, you i'll say it right now you're wasting your time with the television the radio filling your mind with all these things and then be, and then all your friends become echo chambers of the same thing and you just hear the conversations people have with each other i mean dominated by you know Let's face it, satanic, uh, you know, follies, or, you know, creations, and, and, and you're not, you're not seeing, you know, you, you know, it's amazing the Bible has is still around, uh, that people haven't, but it, God says it, my word will not, um, 
you know, go away, you know, until everything's fulfilled. And But the word might become scarce. The Bible says it does. It probably will get scarce. And it, at times it did get scarce. I remember I read that recently somewhere. But we have the word of God. Read the word of God. Find cool ways to do it. You know, the, the angle of prophecy, that's a great way. That Everyone should probably start there. You know, then you have respect. You have respect for the words of God because you see the f prophetic fulfillment. So you got to overcome the respect issue. If you don't have respect for the word of God, it's it's just nonsense. You think it's circular reasoning. It's not circular reasoning. No, you have independent, um, objective evidence for it. I mean, you have the Septuagint, every... Even critics have to admit the Septuagint was in existence before Christ. You know, Alexander the Great, who, you know, he spent 15 years as a warrior, basically. And let me put this down again. As a warrior, he spent 15, you know, and then he dies in Babylon. Of all places, he dies in Babylon. Um, and, and he conquered all, he never lost a battle. Right, but he he Hellenized areas, you know, in uh, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, he he wanted to continue that with the Seleucid dynasty and, and get, you know convert everything into Greek, and they did. The old old the, he he commissioned the Old Testament to be written into Greek, amazing, and it was the scribes did it, and um and it shows you. Prophecies about Jesus, you know, Hosea 11, 1, he'll be out of Egypt, right? Well, Jesus ended up coming out of Egypt. He was chased over there. He had to come back because Herod was killing everybody, all the babies. You know, Micah 5, 2 would be from Bethlehem, right? Um, it'd be Isaiah 7 and 9, he's, he's from Galilee or Nazarene, you know what I mean? So um, how could Jesus... Did anybody do qualify? You know, and yes, Jesus did. He did. He was from all these places. And just by his birth, you know, he qualifies. So, I mean, there's hundreds, probably a hundred prophecies in the Old Testament for, for, for Christ. His birth and his death and his resurrection. So once you have that established, my point is, when is that established?